of kings, Lord of lords, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, and elect of God, His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I. These were the titles bestowed on Rastafari Makonnen when he was crowned Emperor of the Ethiopian Empire on the 2nd of November 1930. As leader of a civilization that had lasted for over 3,000 years, the new emperor would now be seen by millions around the world as a universal symbol of African pride and sovereignty at a time when virtually all indigenous African kingdoms had fallen under European subjugation. And over the course of his 44-year reign as emperor, Haile Selassie would be many things to many people. To some, an imperialist and brutal despot, to others, a symbol of anti-imperialism and freedom. To some, an arrogant and selfish monarch, but to others, a literal messiah and God incarnate. Paradoxes and contradictions may be common to all major historical figures, but not many mixed oil and water quite like the last emperor of the Ethiopian Empire. There is a well-known Ethiopian folktale which tells of how Tafari's father, Ras Makonnen, governor of the Ethiopian province of Harar, was visited one day by a hermit who came to deliver a prophecy. Fighting alongside his cousin Emperor Menelik II, Makonnen had played a leading role at the famous Battle of Adwa in which Ethiopian forces defeated Italy in a raging battle which would ultimately secure Ethiopia's status as one of only two African countries to have never been colonized. But despite his great military successes and political achievements, Makonnen was a man in crisis. His beloved wife had been having serious troubles with childbearing and had suffered a series of miscarriages. According to the folktale, however, Makonnen's troubles were finally resolved when the hermits delivered to him the following prophecy. This time, the child your wife is pregnant with will come into the world in the best of health and survive. He will grow up to be a fine boy, and when he is still a young man, he would rise to become ruler of Ethiopia and govern the whole country with a firm hand. He will bestow greatness and pride upon Ethiopia and make it renowned the world over. But ultimately, he will destroy everything he has built with his own hands and leave the country in ruins. As with many stories about the late emperor, whether or not the events described actually happened will forever remain a mystery. But putting aside questions of factual accuracy, the hermit's prophecy from this mystical origin story provides an almost perfect summary of the complicated life and legacy of one of the most consequential leaders in modern African history. Born to a noble family in eastern Ethiopia, Tafari Makinen was surrounded by privilege and prestige from the very earliest years of his life. Through his mother's bloodline, Tafari laid claim to Ethiopia's Solomonic dynasty, which according to traditional beliefs, had ruled the empire from as far back as the year 980 BC. According to an ancient text known as the Kebra Nagast, which is translated as the Glory of Kings, the Solomonic dynasty began when Makeda, the Queen of Sheba, traveled from Ethiopia to visit Israel's King Solomon, the son of David. Although this famous meeting between the two monarchs is referenced in both the Old and New Testaments of the Christian Bible, the Kebra Nagast goes into more detail telling of how the queen fell pregnant shortly after meeting King Solomon and subsequently gave birth to his son Menelik I, who ultimately became the first Solomonic emperor of Ethiopia. His privileged upbringing and noble blood notwithstanding, Tafari Makinen's childhood was not necessarily an easy one. The early deaths of both his parents would see Tafari adopted by his father's cousin, Emperor Menelik II. 
Growing up in the corridors of power, the young Tafari would gain a first-rate education in power politics and develop a unique blend of charm and ruthlessness, which would ultimately see him rise to the very top of Ethiopian society. Standing at just over five foot tall, Tafari Makinen was noticeably shorter than most Ethiopian nobles, but what he lacked in physicality, he more than made up for in charisma and ambition. At just age 13, Tafari had been appointed titular governor of Salale, and by the age of 18, he assumed control of his late father's former province of Harar. And just six years later, at the tender age of 24, he became the most powerful man in Ethiopia in all but name when he was appointed as Ethiopia's imperial regent. But Tafari's rise to power would be just as much a result of good fortune as it was due to his political genius. You see, just around the same time as Tafari's coming of age, the ruling Emperor Menelik II had fallen seriously ill and was under pressure to choose a successor. Out of all the Emperor's potential heirs, the only two reasonable options in his opinion were his grandson, Lij Eyasu, and his eldest daughter, Wazero Zauditu. In June 1908, Emperor Menelik suffered a severe stroke and fearing impending death, announced Lij Eyasu as his chosen successor. But due to Eyasu's young age, the Emperor requested that elder statesman Rasta Semanadu be appointed as Regent Plenipotentiary until Lij Eyasu was old enough to govern. However, not too long after his appointment as Regent, Rasta Sema suddenly died after also suffering a stroke. Although Menelik was still alive at this point, he was now slowly drifting away on his deathbed. It was here that the young Lijiyasu decided to seize his opportunity. Defying senior members of the imperial court, Lijiyasu refused to share power or agreed to the appointment of a new regent. And so at just 14 years of age, Iyasu became the empire's de facto ruler. For obvious reasons, Iyasu's power grab would prove to be very unpopular amongst Ethiopia's power brokers. Working to ensure that he was not officially crowned emperor while they plotted his demise, senior members of the royal court would even refuse to announce Emperor Menelik's death for a full three years after his demise in 1913. Iyasu's enemies would finally succeed in bringing him down when in 1916, he was accused and tried for the crimes of treason and apostasy. Following a vindictive campaign led by the Minister of War, Iyasu was found guilty of converting to Islam and he was banished from the palace before being officially deposed. His aunt, Wazero Zauditu, was then named Empress in September 1916, with Tafari Makanen appointed as a regent and heir to the throne. What followed would be 14 years of strife, political maneuvering and bloodshed, in which Iyasu loyalists would unsuccessfully attempt to regain the throne and a fallout between the more progressive Rastafari and the traditionalist Empress Zauditu would result in a failed attempt to overthrow Tafari as regent. But after all was said and done and the dust settled, Tafari Makinen ultimately emerged victorious. His campaign for ultimate power began with him forcing the Empress Zauditu to crown him king in October 1928. And following Empress Zauditu's sudden death two years later, Tafari was finally crowned the Negusa Negast, meaning the King of Kings of the Ethiopian Empire. And from his coronation onwards, Tafari would now be addressed as His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie I. But unbeknown to the newly crowned emperor, news of his coronation would quickly see him become the central figure of a new religion birthed on a land far, far away from the boundaries of his kingdom. On a small British colony, where black bodies had long been subject to scorn, ridicule and subjugation, the news of Selassie's coronation would now be seen by thousands of black Jamaicans as a sign that the day of salvation was at hand. With a Bible in one hand, and in the other, 
a copy of the iconic June 1931 issue of National Geographic magazine. Preachers of a new religion known as Rastafarianism began proclaiming a new gospel. According to them, Selassie's coronation was the fulfillment of a prophecy by the Pan-African activist Marcus Garvey, who famously encouraged his supporters to look to Africa, where a black king shall be crowned, for the day of deliverance is near. Despite facing strong resistance from the British colonial authorities, the new movement quickly began to grow under the leadership of his leading preacher, Leonard Howell. Defying the local authorities, Howell began proclaiming Haile Selassie as God in the flesh and urged his fellow black Jamaicans to no longer see themselves as British subjects but as Ethiopians. Howell would also claim that the emperor was arranging ships to repatriate all willing Jamaicans to the promised land of Ethiopia. Around 5,000 coronation photographs of the emperor would be reportedly reprinted and distributed amongst his followers for use as travel passports in anticipation of their redemptive journey to the land they now dreamingly refer to as Zion. But in sharp contrast to the Rastafarian vision of Ethiopia as an African paradise governed by a benevolent African messiah, the daily life of the average Ethiopian living under Emperor Haile Selassie's rule was hardly enviable. Despite his rich history and status as one of the oldest Christian civilizations in the world, Selassie's Ethiopia was far behind his European and Asian peers in terms of technological and economic progress. Like most ancient monarchies, Ethiopia under Haile Selassie's rule was essentially a feudal society in which an elite minority composed of monarchs, noblemen and clergy exerted almost absolute dominance over a large peasant population who were kept in line through a combination of force and tradition. Despite several attempts to ban the practice, slavery was still common in many parts of the country, with an estimated 2 million people believed to have been in some form of forced servitude as at the time of Haile Selassie's coronation in 1930. Social mobility was more or less non-existent, and with the exception of the country's capital of Addis Ababa, modern innovations like electricity, road networks, and telephone lines were virtually unheard of. But perhaps the most pervasive of all of Ethiopia's structural issues was the way in which the concentration of all power and wealth in the hands of its noble families basically meant that the never-ending dramas and eternal squabbles between the empire's numerous princes, noblemen, and clergy often had very severe ramifications on the day-to-day -day life of the average Ethiopian subject. Although the generally low standard of living of the vast majority of Ethiopians living under Selassie's rule did not negatively affect the growth of the Rastafarian movement, the biggest test of faith for his most ardent believers would come in the year 1935 when Selassie would be forced to flee his kingdom following a violent invasion by the fascist Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. Fox Movie Tone brings you the world's news. Lowell Thomas speaking. Rome. In a blazing radio address, Mussolini proclaims his decision, war. Despite the League of Nations, Italy will conquer Ethiopia. Addis Ababa, Haile Selassie protests to the League that the Italians have already invaded Ethiopia. So the Emperor orders complete mobilization. He marshals his hosts of fighting men to defend his frontiers. The Emperor broadcasts an impassioned plea to the outside world to save Ethiopia from Italian conquest. The President of the Ethiopian Parliament speaks, and an American radio man introduces the Emperor, especially to America. Hello, America. This is Addis Ababa. He defends his country's cause, calls upon the world to stop the war, and declares that Ethiopia is firmly for peace. Le peuple éthiopien est ferme et fermement attaché à la paix, mais il est en même temps... A nation praying for peace but ready to fight to the last. Rome deciding war. The League of Nations preparing to impose penalties. 
The clash of arms, the thunders of battle seem more terrifying, as at the radio station of Addis Ababa, the Emperor Haile Selassie pleads for peace. You see, while other African kingdoms were falling under the control of various European powers, Selassie had worked hard to secure his nation's sovereignty by making sure Ethiopia became a sovereign member of the League of Nations. Ethiopia's entry into the world's first intergovernmental organization was particularly opposed by Italy, who had long seen Ethiopia as the perfect addition to its sphere of influence in East Africa. Completely disregarding the non-aggression principles agreed by all League of Nations member states, Benito Mussolini's forces embarked on a brutal campaign to take control of Ethiopia and exert revenge for Italy's famous defeat at the 1896 Battle of Adwa. Despite giving an iconic speech in June 1936 at the League of Nations Geneva headquarters, in which he admonished member states for their idleness in the face of Mussolini's aggression, Selassie would be ultimately forced to flee his country when it became clear that there was no stopping the Italian advance. Just five years after his glorious coronation, Ethiopia's King of Kings had found himself under the protection of the British Crown in the small English city of Bath where he was forced to take refuge. A long way away from the luxuries of his imperial palace, the emperor reportedly became so destitute that even the local bookshop refused to extend his credit. The very same man believed to be the African Messiah had been driven out of Africa by one European power and was now only being kept alive thanks to the goodwill of another. Selassie's expulsion from Ethiopia would even see him being branded as a coward by his forerunner, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. But even at this his lowest point, Selassie continued to maintain the support of many others within the African diaspora as the Italian invasion of Ethiopia triggered an overwhelming outpouring of support for the emperor and his nation all around the Caribbean islands and the United States. Salvation eventually came in 1941, when the Italians were driven out of Ethiopia by British forces fighting alongside members of the Ethiopian resistance during the Allied Powers World War II East Africa campaign. Notwithstanding the massive helping hand he received from the Allied Powers, Selassie's return to Ethiopia would reinvigorate beliefs about his divinity and more importantly, build his image as a symbol of African resistance amongst many within the various Pan-African and anti-imperialist movements that had just began growing at the time. It is good that you are here record this picture of me in my palace garden at Addis Ababa. People who see this throughout the world will realize that even in the 20th century, with faith, courage, and a just cause, David will still beat Goliath. Taking full advantage of his increased popularity in the years that followed his return, Haile Selassie began working to continue the great modernization drive which had begun under the reign of Emperor Menelik II. In addition to general improvements to the country's legal system, most notably in